In our first episode this season, we talked about how my dad wrote this book, Path Lit by Lightning, The Life of Jim Thorpe. Today, and in our next episode, we're going to talk about Jim Thorpe's life and some of the details in the book itself. Okay, hey Dad, how are you? It's a beautiful day in Madison. I'm doing well. And I've got the book, finally. So Let's see it. it is. <laughs> the real, Path, yeah. as they say, I-R-L, in real life. <laughs> how many pages is that one, Dad? It's the longest book I've written, um, so total pages is 657, but that goes up, or 659, that goes all the way to the index. Okay. So the actual story is 568 pages. Would Obama be? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I think uh, uh, They Marched into Sunlight was my longest book before this one. Uh, okay. Uh, but as you said, it it reads swiftly, um, and uh, today we're going to talk about um, the book itself, uh, not just how you wrote it. Um, but because it is a 659-page book, <laughs> and I've read it, um, I was thinking about how to, you know, talk about it in about an hour or so. Um, there's no way to cover it all. Um, but what I think is interesting whenever I read your books is how you choose to start them, especially the biographies, because um, I was thinking it's a bit like a painting because it's a slice of life, but you're the artist and you, you sort of guide the focal point. You tell us where to start, where to look first, and then, and then from there we fill in the scene in a way. So how do you start this book? Well, they actually started in two ways, Sarah. And, you know, I, I'm not big on introductions or prefaces. As a matter of fact, in one of my books, I think it was like one paragraph <laughs> uh, in They Marched in the Sunlight. This one, I, I started um, in media res when Jim Thorpe is home from Stockholm after the Olympics. Um, and he's being paraded around the East Coast. Um, and he's at the height of his fame, um, a world-famous figure, the greatest athlete in the world. Um, so I started it there, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But after I'd written the whole book, I decided, well, this one needs a little bit more of a preface than some of my other books. And so I went back and wrote a three-page preface, which gives you a little fuller understanding of why I wrote the book and what Jim Thorpe represents and what he endured and sort of my take on him at the end, which is that, yes, there was a lot of diff there were a lot of difficulties in his life, but I didn't view it as a tragedy. I viewed it as a story of perseverance. And that sets up where the story begins, which is at the height of his fame. Um, and I did that for two reasons. One is, I knew that's what, if people know about Jim Thorpe, that's what they know. And I wanted to set them right there at a place that they're familiar with, Jim Thorpe, the greatest athlete in the world. Um, but I also wanted to use it as a way of um, connecting him to his Native American history. And, you know, he was from the Sac and Fox Indians. He was a member of the Thunder Clan. And the greatest member of that clan in history was Black Hawk the world-famous Blackhawk, for whom the Chicago Blackhawks are named. Um, there's, you know, Blackhawk just runs throughout American history in so many ways, that name and that person. Um, and so once I had researched Blackhawk and the notion that Jim Thorpe's mother told him he was um, the reincarnation of the great warrior Blackhawk, then I saw this incredible parallel between Jim Thorpe at the height of his fame, after he won his gold medals, and Black Hawk at the height of his fame, after what was called the Black Hawk War, which was really a massacre uh, of, his, of his tribe, um, when he was captured and paraded through the East Coast um, as the most famous Indian in the world, just as Jim Thorpe was um, some 80 years later. And so I was able to both present Jim Thorpe at the height of his fame and what happened as he was hailed um, in New York City and Philadelphia and Carlisle where he was in school 
and Black Hawk as he was taken through the, many of these same places um, as a prisoner of war. And so that's how I start the book, both in the moment of Jim Thorpe's fame and then connecting him back um, to his most famous ancestor. Yeah. I think that is so useful because then, um, in a sense, the, the idea of myth-making and the duality of his existence in a, in his, with his heritage and the dominant culture's expectations for him and so forth, like, we've already been um, introduced to those things from the beginning um, with the way you started. Uh, and you talk about the Olympics, uh, and it was the 1912 Olympics being, um, in a sense, the height of his fame. And, uh, and I just want to talk about that particular um, experience, because I loved this part of the book where you describe the um, Olympic uh, team setting sail from New York. Um, and I think you describe it, June 14th, 1912, 8 a.m., YMCA corner of 6th Avenue and 23rd, blue blazers, white slacks, white shoes, and white straw um, boaters, is that right? Yes. With black silk bands. Uh, anyway, it's just this gorgeous uh, image of the whole uh, you know, group of athletes um, about to set sail and then participate in this historic, it's the fifth fifth Olympiad of the, or the fifth modern Olympiad. Um, and of course, I want to ask you how you researched that, but um, I also want you to walk us through what he was about to do. What was his event? How did he train for it? And, you know, why, how did he become the greatest athlete in the world uh, during that Olympics? Well, at Carlisle Indian Industrial School, um, Thorpe had been a star track star. Um, you know, in most in most college track of that era, and even today, um, the event that he was brilliant at, the decathlon, which is ten events, um, from running to weights to, to jumping, um, really a test of your incredible of all of your athletic skills on a track and field. Um, that wasn't most most uh, uh, meets didn't have the decathlon in it, but they did have many of the events from the decathlon. And so he was, you know, in, in, in Carlisle, he would compete against Penn at the Penn Relays, which was the most famous track meet um, on the East Coast, against Syracuse and, and all of the really good track schools um, in the East. And he and his little teammate, Louis Tuanama, would win every meet. I mean, they were, they were terrific at so many different events, from the hurdles to the shot put, um, uh, to some of the, the races. I, I mean, Tuanama was a long-distance runner. In any case, so he was... Uh, they, they didn't have an actual tryout for the decathlon to get onto the Olympic team, but everybody knew that he was good at so many events that he would be um, one of the decathletes. Um, and the way I wanted to start that chapter, um, and the way I try to write everything I do is to make the reader feel that they're there. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a documentarian, but, but my writing style it tends to be sort of in that style so that um, I come in and out of that, but the reader always feels that they're part of, of that time and place, um, which, was, which is everything. Time and place allows you to go to so many other things, into your own thoughts and assessments um, and the, the nuances of a story. But as long as you set it in a time and place and the reader feels they're there, they're willing to yeah. go with you to all those other places. So that was the morning that they boarded the ship. I wanted, it, I found it as a way not only to make the reader feel that the, the, the readers feel they were there, but also to introduce some of the other characters who were on board that ship. And that was the way to do that. So that as they're boarding the ship and as they're going across the Atlantic, you become more and more familiar with that moment, with the characters, and with what's to come. Yeah. And I just want to say that um, some of the descriptions of his journeys um, are the kind of the most magical. And, and there's a part of me, as I read the book, knowing that he endured a lot of loss. Uh, there were some exquisite moments of opportunity and joy, too, um, that you captured there. And then later when he does the, uh, the world tour with the yeah. Giants, 
and his and his new bride, you know. And I just thought most people never have that in their life at all, you know. And and I don't know when we look at um, people who have great fame, and we sometimes then feel sadness for the losses they endure. It, it's nice to see in such detail descriptions of of the height, you know, of the the moments. Um, that most of us never have in our lives. I think that's a very important point, Sarah, and it's one thing I wanted to to emphasize in the book. Um, that yes, as the as the story progresses, you see some low points. Um, but my feeling about life, something I actually learned from my big brother Jim, was that life is basically built on sensations um, and memory. And Jim Thorpe had some amazing sensations and memory in his life which in the totality of examining that life raises it. Um, you know, not just in a sort of a, an athletic heroic s- standard, but also just in what one can enjoy out of life and remember from it, which is more universal than the heroic. Um, and so, um, yeah, the, the, both, both of those journeys, and, and starting with, the, with the, uh, the, the journey across the Atlantic to Stockholm, we're, in, we're incredible, and, and you know, um, just so many rich moments about that that I wanted to capture. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and when you describe his success, and you know, when we say he was the greatest athlete in the world, um, and and then you look at it, you say Thorpe finished seven hundred points ahead of his nearest competitor. <laughs> okay, so. Um, he didn't just win; he won by um, oh, a lot. Said, it was right? it was no contest, and he okay. won two gold medals: the first in the pentathlon, All right. which is shorter, uh, kind of like a shorter decathlon. It's five yeah. events instead of ten. Um, and the scoring system in that was a little. I mean, the scoring systems in all of those multi-event events are mm-hmm. convoluted. Um, in the pentathlon, you actually uh, the fewer points you had, the the, the better you were. You know, because okay. yeah, because if you got one point, that means you won the event. Um, yeah. The decathlon had, you know, went into the thousands of points, and um, even great uh, Olympic historians can't even uh, fully explain some of the point systems. But in any case, in both of those uh, multi-sport events, uh, he he blew the competition away, and and especially in the decathlon. Um, and most of the competitors, I think. There were maybe 29, I'm, I'm one or two off perhaps on that, 29 competitors in the decathlon, and more than half of them um, could, couldn't make it all the way through the 10 events, wow. including his great future nemesis, Avery Brundage, um, the future president of the International Olympic Committee, who quit after um, performing poorly in the first several events. Mm. One of the things you do with um, describing the Olympics is also the coverage of the Olympics back in the States. And how did you start to notice the way that Thorpe was talked about um, in the sense of, I think you referenced that at first he's an Indian, he's performing as an Indian, and then as he wins, the press starts to describe him in a different way. Oh, absolutely. Well, first of all, he was already... He wasn't world famous before the Olympics, but he was incredibly well known in the sporting world in the United States before the Olympics, largely because of his football skills. Mm -hmm. Um, He'd been an All-American football player in 1911 at at Carlisle and had defeated Harvard and and Penn, and and he had, you know, he was brilliant, um, a first-team All-American. So, and, and I had seen him being described in the press for many years before the Olympics, always as the big Indian or the great Aborigine or, you know, various um, racist or borderline racist descriptions of him. And that was the case as he was going to the Olympics. And then all of a sudden when he won, he was the great American. (laughs) You know, uh, not even the Native American, but just, you know, the the, the country adopted him uh, with pride so much so that the president of the United States then, William Howard Taft, wrote a telegram congratulating um, Thorpe and saying that he represented the best of American, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but that he's what every American citizen should want to live up to, you know, the best of American citizenship. And the truth is, 
Jim Thorpe was not even an American citizen because most Native Americans were not given citizenship yet. And you talk about that in the book, obviously. Um, is it 1916 that he's granted citizenship or that he applies for it? He's 20... 20- well, yes, it's, ni- it's after 25 years of, of him being treated as a second-class citizen. Um, all of his royalties and all of that came due, and he was then granted citizenship, yes, um, after he had already reached his, the height of fame. Right. Um, uh, but citizenship came to Native Americans, indigenous peoples, at different times over the course of a long period of time. Some, some were citizens in the 1800s, a few, um, and most didn't get their citizenship until the teens and even the 20s of the, of the 20th century. Mm-hmm. Well, you write, the first half of Jim's life, the central issue in the relationship between Native Americans and the federal government involved how Indians were to be assimilated into the dominant white culture once they were no longer being tracked down and killed by the U.S. Army. Um, And uh, the first half of his life um, you place in context not only in his education or um, his exploitation at the Carlisle School, um, but also... um, of, of the greater um, population of Native Americans and uh, losing their land and, and so forth and um, children being sent to Carlisle. And you talked about that just now, but for those who haven't read the book, I think one of the fuzzy things in our head is, okay, he's at Carlisle, which is a school. It's not a college per se, but he's playing against, you know, the teams uh, Harvard, you know, they play football against, and this will come up again in terms of how old is he anyway when he's playing right. against college students and this or that. And then obviously this affects when he um, works during the summer and ends up playing professional ball, right? And yes. then that has a consequence on his Olympic medal. So how can we understand what it meant to go to Carlisle for Jim Thorpe and to play sports for Carlisle in terms of... Um, uh, who they competed against, and also what was expected of uh, of the students um, for part of the year when they weren't being educated. Well, um, there's a lot there. I mean, Carlisle um, was not a college, and it wasn't a high school, but it was a school. It was called an industrial school. But its main purpose was education was part of it, but only education in a specific sense, which was acculturation and assimilation. The point of those schools was to try to drum the Indianness out of Indians and make them as white as possible. Um, that's why they existed. That was the entire philosophy of the American government, really starting. Uh, In some ways, the year Jim Thorpe was born in 1887, when the Dawes Act effort was to basically strip the Indians of their communal land and make them individual property owners, making them more white in that sense. I mean, Indians lived communally. Um, White America lived individually, privately, as owners of land. To To the Native Americans, the land was natures, and we were just, you know, the stewards of it. Um, in any case, so that started in 1887, and then, then the schools of which the Carlisle Indian Industrial School was the flagship school of the entire uh, fleet of Indian schools, some of which were government-run, some of which were run by Catholic, the Catholic Church or other churches. Um, those were the acculturation efforts. Uh, on the education front and to take the young Native Americans away from their reservations, away from their past, away from their religion, away from their culture, and teach them the other way, the white mainstream way. Um, so it was, a, you know, in some ways it was very cruel and crude, and, um, and in other ways um, it was successful for certain of those people, including Jim Thorpe, in the sense that that's how he became famous. They had a football team. He was a brilliant athlete. 
Um, the football team competed, as you say, against all of the great colleges of the East Coast, even though it wasn't exactly a college. But this is way before the NCAA existed, before there were really uh, sort of organizational structures and rules about college football. And the Carlisle School was a great attraction. It was kind of like, um, you know, uh, Wild, Wild Bill Hick, Buffalo Bill Cody, you know, bringing his Wild West show. Um, but this was, these were Indian football players. They were considered exotic. They were great, great attractions, gate attractions. So all of the colleges put them on the schedule for home games for the colleges because it made them money. Harvard made money off of Penn, made money off of Syracuse, West Point. And so that's how the football team grew in stature. They also had a coach who was very successful, who came from Cornell, um, Pop Warner, um, who was in many ways not the greatest individual, but was an excellent football coach and very wily and creative. Um, and he saw Jim Thorpe um, sort of a way to reach the heights of football, which he did with that team. Native Americans um, in that era in particular um, were terrific athletes and, and, and used as great athletes in sports that were not their traditional sports. It wasn't lacrosse or, or running as much as football and baseball at, at Carlisle. Um, so that, that's how Jim Thorpe got to Carl at age 17, stayed there off and on, as much off as on, uh, through 1912. Um, so that's eight years um, uh, where he was affiliated with Carlisle and finally reaching that pinnacle of success in 1912. Um, he comes back from the Olympics and returns to Carlisle, yes. is that, that's correct. And I believe um, it was in November of 1912 that Carlisle would play Army, is that right? Uh, yeah, it was one of my favorite football games of all time. Um, yeah, at West Point, uh, on the plains at West Point where their field was then, it was before Mikey Stadium was built uh, overlooking the Hudson River. Um, and it was the chance for the Indians to face their old nemesis, the U.S. Army, on a level playing field for the first time. Of course, it was football. It wasn't life or death. Um, but it was an amazing moment. And uh, the Carlisle Indians prevailed 27-6 to against an Army team that uh, was stocked with good players, including a a running back and, and linebacker named Dwight David Eisenhower, the future president, um, and Thorpe was the star of the game. I would say that the two games in his college career made him a national figure um, mm -hmm. uh, and considered the greatest football player of that those years, but also one of the greatest of all time. And one of those games was against Harvard in 1911, um, where he was brilliant both running the ball and tackling and kicking, um, mm -hmm. and Army in 1912. And really the Army game sort of was magical um, for, for those historic reasons. You describe it uh, for this one afternoon on the plain of West Point within a short march of Custer's tomb. Uh, and you say it was payback, uh, the rattling of bones, I think you say Gus Welch called it later. Um, a character. So the the players from Carlisle um, could. It was probably a palpable feeling for them as they uh, took on Army, um, and as you said, uh, trounced them <laughs> essentially. Um, yeah, and, and the coach Pop uh, Warner played it up. I mean, he went to every player before the game and talked about what this sort of payback was all about. Um, as a smart uh, football coach might. You know, generally speaking, um, as I think I say in the first paragraph of that chapter, football players aren't thinking about larger issues. You know, they're thinking about tackling and blocking and running and maybe a girlfriend in the stands and not much else. But this this case was different. It was, it was special because of that. 
historical resonance. Wow. And you know, one of the fun things, I think, for sports fans, especially football fans, actually, Jim Thorpe played so many sports, baseball fans, football fans, um, uh, I guess, um, you name it, he, he played it or touched upon it. But you talk about what football was like in 1906. You talk about it as the years go on. Um, you'll say, what was football like in 1907 and, and so forth. And there, um, so just like, or even what the um, gridiron was and the pigskin and the size of the ball. But just to get a sense of the type of play that they had then, you say, in 1906, and again, I know that the game against Army was 1912, but still, it's, uh, uh, you say the rules in football were few, <laughs> and uh, you talk about the number of injuries. From 1901 to 1905, 71 recorded deaths in football, um, and you say the unofficial casualty count of 1905 read like a military after-action report. And that's just in that one year, 18 deaths, one paralyzed, one eyes gauged out, two intestines ruptured, um, you have four arms broken, seven legs, 11 ribs, I mean, it goes on and on, and two concussions, which there presumably were more, but... Um, more, yeah. But then the irony... Christian reformers encouraged Native American boys to play football, the game of Harvard and the Ivy League boys, because the indigenous game of lacrosse was too savage. Exactly. That tells you all about the perceptions of, of white America versus uh, the Native American perceptions. Um, but football was, was a brutal, I mean, it still is a brutal sport. Mm -hmm. But it was so... Um, violent and deadly in that era that it was almost banned like boxing would later be in colleges um, in the early 1960s um, and it was such that Teddy Roosevelt the president had to call an emergency meeting of all of the leaders of college football and urge them to sort of modify some of the rules to make it a little bit safer um, you know that's been an ongoing process ever since right I mean even in in the last 10 years, there have been rules changes to try to um, s slow down the onslaught of c concussions and other I injuries. Um, but even in its earliest days, um, it was even more brutal and more apparent um, that it could be a deadly sport. Absolutely. And it was also relentless. Am I right that there was only the players played offense and defense? It wasn't like go yeah. off the field for a while and uh, warm up and have Gatorade. Uh, <laughs> well, you know. no, there's not an offensive team and a defensive squad. There were 60-minute players. Um, if the game was 60 minutes, that's another thing. It could be a lot of different times of games in that period. Um, but in any case, if you went off the field, you couldn't get, go back on. Um, if you were substituted for, that was the end of your game. So it was more like... Um, European football or soccer as we call it here in that <laughs> sense and it really evolved from rugby and a little bit of soccer I mean that's where football came from mostly rugby and so when you were describing the differences in that era another one was the shape of the football um, it wasn't as spherical and so I mean so it, it wasn't as sharply pointed so it was harder to throw a, a spiral um, it was a little harder it was easier to drop kick it meaning you let the ball hit the ground and then you kick it, um, then it would be when, when it had that sharp point and who knows where, how it would bounce. Um, there were so many differences in the shape of the football, the shape of the field. At first it was 110 yards, um, and that I didn't know. You know, there's so much that I learned about the game re researching this book, but the, the, the reason it's called a gridiron is because in those days the, uh, the chalk lines went both horizontal and vertical, creating a real grid, and that's, mm -hmm. that's why I got that name. Of course, the, the, uh, the vertical lines disappeared after, after, at some point. And I know that Pop Warner is a, you know, he, he enters Jim's life uh, in, you know, different moments, has different purposes, and um, complicated, certainly, but but it is interesting to hear how he tinkered, you know, that he had 
um, sort of an inventor's mind with certain things and shoes and, and um, or sewing. I think you said he had hidden pockets sewn into uniforms <laughs> and, and things like that. I mean, he's a character. I know he's well, not. Yeah, he is a character, and I love the way you can do things that are a football. Matter of fact, when I sent the uh, the first uh, copy of that chapter to my editor, Bob Bender, and Simon and Schuster, he circled that and said, oh, God, I wish we could do that today. And it was about a play they had where one of their ends disappeared behind the, uh, the not he didn't go to the stands, but he went behind the players on the opposite team sidelines. He came out on the other side and they threw the ball. Uh, and there was another play, you're right, where he designed um, a sort of a kangaroo pocket in, in one of the players so they could hide the ball in there and the opposition wouldn't know who had the ball. Um, they scored a touchdown that way as well. Um, Warner was, um, but more than even those trick plays, he was also an innovator. He he was the originator of, not the inventor of the forward pass, but one of its first strong proponents. Um, the uh, the innovator of the of this double wing formation and many other uh, formations. Uh, he, he was constantly tinkering without a. You know, he would take. He would sit down at a at a cafe near the school and and use salt and pepper shakers and design plays and write them on the side of a napkin. Um, and in that era, you know, everything hadn't been decided yet. Um, and you know, there there were fourteen coaches on a team. You know, staying up all night uh, watching film of the other team. So it was, it was much more basic than that. And in that basic way. Pop Warner was a true innovator. We don't have a lot of time to go into it, but it is also interesting how certain things um, are, um, in a sense, you know, sometimes we feel like, oh, we're so modern now, or things are different now than they were then. But even then, it sounds like relatively quickly, once the football team, you know, earned money and became a fame, help the school become famous. You you even mentioned special dormitories for the football players. Um, There's nothing new under the sun in terms of football, money, and corruption. It's been there from the very beginning in different ways. You know, it's sort of petty corruption, but it is a corruption of the uh, what might be called the amateur ideal. So yeah, right. the football players were given special treatment. Um, they were paid um, by Pop Warner, not much, but they were they were getting allotments, um, and they were getting you know clothes from the clothiers in downtown Carlisle, and and uh, you know all of the special things that that football players get. You know, a much larger scale um, in later decades when they were getting cars and and big chunks of cash from from rich alumni. Um, but that system of corruption has been there. It was there in 19, the early 1906, 7, 8 period. It was there in the 1920s when there were huge scandals and several teams were banned because of that. All the way through, I remember when I was in Texas, uh, the Southwest Bureau Chief for the Washington Post, um, Southern Methodist University, you know, this great religious Methodist university, was given what was called the death penalty because they were cheating so much and paying players so much. But yes, it, it goes all the way back. And I've written about that in in um, my other book about that deals with football, uh, When Pride Still Mattered, about Vince Lombardi. And I sort of call it the fallacy of the innocent past. The past was never as innocent as people want to believe. Right. Path Lit by Lightning, The Life of Jim Thorpe is available online and at bookstores on August 9th. Visit davidmarinus.com to order your copy. This has been an episode of the David Marinus Ink in Our Blood podcast. We hope you enjoyed it and that you'll subscribe to the Ink in Our Blood podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or whichever podcast service you prefer. If you loved it, we'd love it if you left a rating and review. Ink in Our Blood is produced by Metamorphosis.agency. Music has been written and provided by Monika Ryan. Ink in Our Blood is hosted by Sarah Marinus Vanderschaff. Thank you for listening. Mm-hmm.